Mac Life for Wednesday, March, March, May 2020, show number 1,156. I'm your host, Sean King, joined as always by my beautiful wife, Melissa. By watch and read the IRC as the show is going on. It's easy to get into the IRC, too. You can either email me to sean at yourmaclifeshow.com, and I will send you instructions, or go to the website, and it's right there in the website. Monty has set it up so that all you can do is click on the link, and it will automatically drop you into the IRC channel. So please join us there. Melissa and I would love to see you there. On tonight's show, we are going to be joined by our good friend Jim Darrell of The Loop at loopinsight.com. As per usual, it is part of his parole. We're going to talk about Apple Car and Apple Glasses. The rumors are running fast and furious once again. Supposedly, Apple Glasses were going to be available next year, 2021. No, they won't. Apple Car, Apple has to control the whole... No, it's not going to happen. We'll talk to Jim about that. Um, Entitled Google employees and newspapers. Do you pine for newspapers? Talk to Jim about that. And then later on, we're going to talk about how to talk good. How to talk right good. I always, as we say in Nova Scotia, how to talk right some good. Uh, I was listening into uh, Melissa's uh, Zoom meeting this morning, and it made me realize there's a bunch of tips and tricks I can offer people about <clears throat> meeting over, you know, about public speaking in general. And Zoom meetings in particular, and we'll pass, I'll pass those on to you, things that I've learned over my 26 plus year career of being an internet broadcaster, projecting to the back row. <clears throat> that hurts. I shouldn't do that. Uh, all that and more. Don't forget our friends at Nomad at nomad, nomadgoods.com. These folks right, right, right here uh, are giving away a $100, $100 gift certificate on the Gen, June 24th show, the show after Father's Day, but it's not just for a Father's Day thing, but that's when we're doing it. Um, you can go to nomadgoods.com and check it out. All you do is enter the contest by going to our website at yourmaclifeshow.com right there at the top. You can click on the link that says Friends of YML Contest Entry Form. Fill that out. Boom. You're entered into the contest. But if you're a subscriber to Your Mac Life, don't worry about it. You're already entered into the contest. It's automatic. I do the work for you just for being a subscriber. So please uh, subscribe to Your Mac Life. Uh, Monty's going to the beach. Hmm. Would you go to the beach now? I uh, red, red, Normal beaches, not our little beaches here. But if you were going to St. Aug- uh, Monty's going to timeshare in St. Augustine, Florida, a typical Florida beach. Would you go to a beach now? Well, how crowded are they? Because the beaches I grew up on, dis- distancing <laughs> is not a problem. <laughs> not a problem. The beach. Australia, <clears throat> you couldn't throw a rock and hit anybody. One day it was a little busy, a weekend or maybe a long weekend. Sean's like, what is everybody doing here? <laughs> we had So, yes, I would go to my beaches. We had literally five miles of beaches, maybe, maybe 50 people. I was mm-hmm. like, what are the people doing here? This is our beach. He was like, this is not okay. It's crowded. It's not acceptable. So Where did the tourists come from? I would go to beaches. I, would I don't go- know what it's like where Monty's going. I would go to a beach, um, what we think of as a typical beach, but I would just draw a big circle in the sand around me. And that's my social distancing circle. Mm. The problem is you want to go in the water. And other people are going to be doing that. So you're going to be like walking. No, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go. Oh, to the, no, go I, no I, right I'm now. not. Okay. No, I, I, don't, I wouldn't go to those beaches even if it wasn't a it's pandemic. True. So Disney World is opening up. Would you go to Disney World? No. No, no but I, no. I wouldn't go to Disney World until, I mean, first of all, to be clear, I never want to go to Disney World or Disneyland or Disney anything. Even as a kid, I didn't. I had no interest in it. I have no interest. Um, but if I did have an interest in it, I wouldn't go until 2021 at the earliest. Mm. How about you? Have you ever had any interest in going to was no. Disney, was Disney a thing in Australia when you were a kid? No. My brother and his wife went to Disneyland and did. they love that kind of thing. My friends, but... Glenn and Susan, had their honeymoon in Disneyland, mm. which is so funny. Well, they I mean it's fun, right? It's joyful, Hell, I yeah. guess. If you don't have lineups, I think it's whatever. inevitable. So, no, I have no interest. No, there's nothing opening up right now at this early stage of opening up that I would feel compelled to want to go see. No. Or participate in concerts or 
even even our local pubs here have started opening up. Now I don't know what the social distancing rules are at our, our local pubs, but even then I'd be a little. The only one of our local pubs I go to is there's one pub called Persephone. For those of you who are fans, Canadians most likely, fans of the TV show The Beachcombers, you can recognize that name. The um, Nick, the main character, his boat was called the Persephone. So the brewer, uh, there's a pub brewery here called a farm brewery, actually. They make their own hops, grow their own hops. Oh, it's a beautiful place. But Persephone has a huge outdoor section with seating in random places around there. I go to Persephone. I don't know that I'd go inside to a pub and no. sit around. No, they've got um, the deck open in places nope. and, yeah. Here, I'm going to send everybody this link, Persephone, because it's a beautiful place. It really place. is a pretty little place. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah, there's, there's – It's and very part, unique. And part of it is because of my, you know, both Melissa and mine's natural disinclination to hang out with people. Uh, we just generally don't like people very much. Um, I am, so, I'm fussy. I, I love certain people, but uh, so that may be part of it. We, we don't have that need. Or our friend Corey goes stir crazy. You can't get out and 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 meet and greet and mingle and hang out with friends. And I understand that. I, I have no problem with them. I'm not making fun of her for doing it. I also got, but she's very social. We've got liquor stores that are open. We've got grass right there and hammock. Why the hell would I want to go anywhere else? I have a pretty girl who will sit in a hammock with me and bring me <laughs> beer. Why would I go anywhere else? I don't Which understand. He spilled that. all over himself. <laughs> and then I did too. Thank you. <laughs> at least, at least you admit it. So yeah, there's not, there's not much that I can see that I would feel compelled to go to. Um, this has posted the link to the Persephone Brewery. Uh, very slow link coming. Come on, come on. You make me look bad, Persephone. Come on. Oh. Well, that's do, funny. Do, do, do. I'll put you back in the TV. Hmm. Uh, how is, 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 are you scratching that itch that you want to go out and be with people or near people or do things that have been prohibited the last <clears throat> two or three months? I can't think of a single thing that now I know our, our son, Rory, wants to meet up with some of his friends and I completely get that. Yeah. He's got lovely friends. Jasper's a goofy little kid. Lucas is a wonderful young man and he really wants to but uh, I just want to give it a little bit longer. Um, I just feel like cuz a lot of people come here from different places from not just from Vancouver, from Alberta, from everywhere. Just want to wait a while. It's not it it's not just that. It's uh, we I don't know um, where those kids on cool switch, you son of a bitch. Oh, oh. this thing suddenly now won't switch cameras. Hmm. <sighs> it's Wednesday, Monty. I never want to be near most people. <laughs> switch. Switch. You piece of shit. Switch. Jesus Christ. Oh, dear. But dear, I would definitely dear. hop on my bike and ride around to Persephone and go and sit in the outdoor area and have a beer for sure. Oh, Melissa's frozen? Has Melissa, what's, what's Is going it a on? Beer? Yeah, I started to look like what's I was going on? a bit, see how I'm all, all jerky? What, why? Yeah, why is Melissa jerky? Okay. So. Should I? All right, running. All right, hang on, hang on. Let's quit this piece of freaking crap. Okay, quit out of there. Come back to Sean. Start quick time over again. God damn it. So, yeah, so send me an email to Sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. I know Monty is uh, <laughs> going going uh, to St. Augustine, Florida to a timeshare. What about you guys? Are, uh, summer is coming up. Are you uh, planning on going where? Are you going to be sending your kids back to school? Our school has decided uh, for some bizarre reason to go through an amazing amount of effort just to have the kids go back to class one day a week for um, just ridiculous amount of work that they want the kids to go through. I think it's really silly. Uh, they're, they've got one-way hallways. They've got hand-washing stations. All the kids, 
um, have to go into the uh, school and wash hands to take forever to get X number of hundreds of kids through the front door first thing I don't in the know morning. how many there'll be, though. Well, there's what, say 500 kids in the school and they're all going one day a week. It's 100 kids. And kids, there's no time frame. The kid, it doesn't say that every kid has to be there by 9 o'clock. So the kids are going to show up there at whatever time and they're going to be lined up outside <laughs> the school. And it's going to be a bunch of friends who haven't seen each other in three months. Are you going to stand? Are these friends going to stand six feet away, yelling at each other? No, it's not going to happen. Don't know. I mean, Rory's not going, so no. I haven't really put much effort into finding out what the whole thing is. <gasps> um. Yeah, it's it's an odd. So I'm just trying to think of this thing. Will yes, work. McMahon, I think they're staggering the grades. So yeah, they'll so have staggering, you know, grade seven uh, to grade nine. But they're 10. also sta staggering the kids by um, uh, Alpha alphabetical. Maybe alphabetical, but maybe random. But still, yeah. it's going to be a big hassle for a very. This is most I've been talking about this. If this happened in January, let's send the kids back. Then we seriously consider it. Well, school's almost over. So. But it's three weeks. Yeah. It's three, maybe four weeks. That yeah. School's going to be in session. And they're going to a lot of effort. Hand washing stations all over the place. Kids having to wash their hands when they come into the classroom. Another lineup right there. Well, I'm wondering if all that will still be there in September. Like, what are we, are we still going to be taking all these precautions yeah. and have all these protocols? Where does it all end? I think it, it officially ends with a vaccine. God knows when and if that will ever happen. It certainly won't happen this year. Yeah, no, I, I mean, yeah. but I think what is with our <clears throat> what that the R R zero number if, if that's a low enough number for public health people to say, okay, the risk has gotten so low, it's okay for us to go back. Yeah, but, but I and so what if you decide if the vaccine is still very young and because they've been quicker getting a vaccine potential vaccines than any ever before, but would you take that vaccine? I don't know if I would, and I would not want my kid to at this point. I don't know. Why not? Because you don't trust science. Well, because a vaccine, you don't. It's it's too quick. Like like it usually takes a couple of years to get a vaccine. Yes, but it's usually also not every epidemiologist in the world working on the same problem. Still, I, I'd like it. Well, then I show me the studies on, on things like that and let me, because it's just, it's a very different situation. Yeah. So I would be. Dave yeah, D. no, I'm not Cindy. Dave D. Dave. Fortunately, so you know, Sean King, one of the best podcasters do it live. I don't know if anyone else does their podcast live. I think it's just me that's been doing it live. Oh, really? Do they? This time. Oh. Uh, I like live. I've always preferred live. I'm, I, if nothing else, then everyone does this editing and it takes them three weeks to get their podcast up because they have to edit every single um and ah and hmm. break it and out of it. And I can't be bothered. What I does like that mean, live. Mo? I'm not counting on there being an affordable vaccine. You mean... Wow. Well, it's the American healthcare system, so it'll be affordable everywhere else but America. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> Later on in the show, we'll be talking about how to talk good. I'll teach you how to talk better. I know I'm not the greatest example of that, but I got some tips. I got some things to tell you. We'll talk about that. And also up next, we'll talk to our good friend Jim Darrell of The Loop at loopinsight.com. All that and more coming up. This is your Mac Life.
Welcome back, folks. Thank you guys very much for joining here this Wednesday evening. As always, our good friend Jim Darren pulled the loop. At loopinsight.com is with us. Jim, hi, little birdie. Hi, little birdie. Jim. How are you doing? Jim. Yes. Hello. Jim. Hello. 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 What are yes. you talking to birds? Yeah, it's a little birdie. You know what kind of bird? The flies. Are you are you bird watching? No, I don't want some white chick. <laughs> what? What is it oh. with white people calling the cops all the time? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Come on, white folks, you're embarrassing yourself, and you're trying to get people killed. Okay, <laughs> stop it. I mean, Jesus, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm as white as they come, and I've never called the cops. Yeah, I've had the cops call on me. There's a whole different thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, I may have called the cops on you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I've had people say, I'm calling you, and I go, yeah, that's fair. You know, oh, well, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. I mean, if I were you, I would definitely call the cops. Crazy times. I still remember that day at Mackerel Expo when I'm standing. I don't remember who I was talking to, but I remember standing and talking to someone, and they looked over my shoulder, and they had this look on their face like, what the hell? And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw the homeless guy. And I've been around homeless enough to know that just ignore them. You know, you can't help everyone. Help where you can. Ignore the rest. It, it's an awful situation, especially in San Francisco. And But the homeless guy got really close to me. I could feel this homeless guy breathing on my neck. Now I'm, I'm upset at the homeless guy. I'm like, dude, I wanted to say, I, I don't want to get mad at you because you're homeless. I don't want to, you know, be, a, be that guy. But you got to step back. And I turned to look, and it was Jim. Because <laughs> <laughs> out of the corner of my eye, you look freaking homeless, man. <laughs> well, even straight on. Well, like true. It so depends honest. on what you're wearing. But... One of those Macworld Expos that I showed up that nobody had seen me in a year or <laughs> more. Right. And holy shit, yeah, I had uh... long hair and a beard. And... <laughs> yeah. I and do remember. Do you remember, do you remember, do you remember outside? Uh, the the hotel, the Marriott on the corner of Third Street. Uh, I think it was Third, Second or Third. That's there. Um, there was one homeless guy out there that was bothering everybody uh, that came by. And I went out at one point for a smoke, and he was he he wasn't being he was aggressive. He wasn't being violent. And I I just said, "Hey, this is my corner." <laughs> and, and, and he fucking took off. He took right off. So <laughs> there you go. Hey, this is my corner. Yeah. <laughs> we were, Peter Cohen and I were standing outside Dave's one night. For those folks who never had the pleasure, Dave's was this wonderful, really shitty hot dogs. And it was a, a cool, funky place. And Peter Cohen, now Peter Cohen's my height. And at the time, Peter weighed a lot more. Peter was probably pushing damn close to 300 pounds at, at the time. So he and I are standing outside of Dave's, and it's a very small entryway I mean, it might have been raining so we were cl close to the door and these, for lack of a better term it's not as pejorative as it sounds these four white yuppies come, to, come up to the door and they just come off across the street from the hotel i don't know what kind of fancy hotel was across the street but they just uh, we, um uh, oh yeah, okay never mind one got a and a so weird, the argent Ar the argent that's right the argent and so then just we saw them walk out of the argent run across the street and get to, to Peter and I, and Peter looks at him and goes, $10 cover charge. And the guy's <laughs> like, okay. And they gave Peter 40 bucks. <laughs> and I was like, Peter, give that money back, man. <laughs> we spent a lot of time at Dave's. We really, <laughs> really, really did. We spent, we spent far too much time at Dave's. Oh, amen. Amen. That was, that was just hilarious. But, uh, uh, you had a, a fun little rant on uh, Twitter, a uh, real quick one, uh, about uh, Google employees. <laughs> you want to tell people what you were upset about? So Google has this thing for its employees, and, and, and it's great. You know, I get why, why they do it, but they have this thing for their employees where they, uh, they have free cafes. Yeah. So basically – all day long, you eat for free. Now, what, what wasn't in there, because I know people at Google, they also have free, like, kitchenettes on each floor mm -hmm. where you can go and get coffee. And they're made by baristas. It's not, This isn't, like, 
you know, crappy gas station coffee. Yeah. Uh, they have baristas there that make this coffee and you can have, um, uh, you know, scones or whatever that fancy crap is called. Yeah. But they have free meals all day long for all Google employees. So Google, like most companies, furloughed or no, I'm sorry, they, didn't. they sheltered in place and all the employees work from home. Well, the Google employees wanted Google to pay for their meal while they were at home. <laughs> and I, I, I read that. I, so to be clear, I had heard this before and I was just astounded. And then CNBC came out with a story about it. And one person had the balls to say, I don't even own a coffee maker. Google supplies me coffee. <laughs> and now I have a choice to get up in the morning and be groggy or be angry because I have to walk to Starbucks to get a coffee. They actually said that out loud. out loud. And yes, it angered me. It really, and I would be, honestly, I would be, you must have the, the link to the story there. If you could let people see it before the end of the show, I would want, I, I would like for, for the listeners to tell me whether I'm just, like an asshole for, for calling them <laughs> out or if this is actually as bad as what I thought it was. Bec and, and some people t wrote and told me this is a benefit of working for Google. And sure. I said, Oh no, 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 no. They said a legal benefit like their salary. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, no, it is absolutely not. This nope. I know for a fact it is not. It's just a part. So, it is a per it is an amenity. Yeah. So if you have if you've decided that you're so goddamn cheap that you don't want to buy a coffee maker, <laughs> then that is on you. Yeah. That is not on Google. And if oh, one person, another person in the article said that they had to learn how to cook. <laughs> and I said, I'm, are you kidding oh me? Oh my God. Now I get it that not everybody knows how to cook. And until a few years ago, I had no idea how to cook. Yep. I really didn't, but I could, you know, I could scrape together some craft dinner or something, you know, I can order I takeout, some, but, but they, they were complaining that they had to learn how to cook <laughs> because Google was no longer supplying them with meals. Now here's what they used to do. Mm. They used to come in the morning get breakfast, have lunch there, obviously, because they're there. And before they left on the from dinner and take it home, yeah. not just them. And I, I said in the, in the Twitter post, like, fuck it. <laughs> because this is just awful. It, it is really awful. is. It, it just, it's so tone deaf. Especially in a place like San Francisco, for these people to think that somehow they're entitled to these perks and amenities that are at the office building where you're at. If you're not right. at the office building, then you don't get the office building perks. Right. It just seems it's, to me to be common sense. It seems very simple. Yeah. When you work at a restaurant, typically, when you work at a restaurant, you get a free meal during your shift. Yep. Well, you don't get to come in with all your friends and have a free meal when you're not working. That's right. You day off. <laughs> you know, I mean, oh, come God. on. What yeah, and, and it's it's just the entitlement of Silicon Valley. Yeah. And, and I will say Apple charges you for your meal. Yeah, yeah, they always now, have. And and I from from what I understand, Apple always charge for the meals. Yep. Be and now it's a discounted price because they have some great meals there at discounted prices. Oh God, yes. Uh, but but they they want you to know that there's some value in what you're getting here. So yeah, they discount it, but you can get like one full penne marinara yeah. uh, uh, or bolognese for. He's well enough. They can buy their meals. We we, we sell. These are meals, folks, that you would generally probably pay twenty bucks for in a, in a restaurant, right. and these are yeah, these, six ninety five, seven ninety five. They're inexpensive, yeah. but really, yeah, 
And, and you know, I, I, from, I didn't know how expensive sushi was. It's stupid raw fish until recently. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the raw fish there was like uh, 12 bucks or something. Yeah. But I understand that at a sushi, a good sushi restaurant, these things would be like 25 bucks. Yeah, 20, 40 bucks a meal. Yep. And exactly. I mean, and I kept telling these people that were telling me that, like, I can go to McDonald's three times for that. Yeah, yeah. And you you don't even get your food cooked. But the, the, the other side of this coin is Facebook telling employees that if they – Facebook is saying, okay, you have the option to continue to be a remote worker. That's fine. Yep. But as of, uh, I think, January 1st, you have to tell Facebook where you're remote working from. And if you're outside Silicon Valley, they're going to cut your pay. Uh, yeah. Is that I, fair? I, it is fair. Why is that fair? No, that, uh, Sean, I, I went through this uh, before, as far back as 2000. So, uh, it is fair because um, every single company out there um, pays based on where you live. Yes. Every single company. So if you live in Texas, you are going to get the base of what it would be in Texas plus the percent, excuse me, the percentage of what it would be to, to have like a Silicon Valley uh, uh, salary. Yep. If you live in Silicon Valley, you're going to have, you know, a much larger salary because it's so damn expensive to live here. Because the cost I, of living I, is higher. Yes, I understand I, that. I, I found out the other day that my friend, um, he's paying $5,000 a month for rent yep. on, on a place. And five grand. What? The thing is, you can do this when the employee is being hired. After they've been hired, you can't cut their pay because they yes, do you something. Can. No, you can't. Yeah, yes, so, you can. So a, a hockey player who is playing for your beloved Boston Bruins gets traded from New York. Does he get a pay cut because he has to go to Boston? Because Boston's a lower cost of living than, than New York does? We're, we're talking about silly professional sports here. Yes, we're, we're talking about salaries. That's what we're talking about. And you're no, saying well, the salary cut, I mean, they should okay, get a salary so, cut. So so then Facebook should open up a union so that everybody leaves Silicon Valley and goes to Texas or Wyoming uh, where they can make this. Uh, no, that doesn't make sense. Of course what they're doing is right. No, it's dead I mean, wrong. The, you can't and, do it after you've yes, employed you me. Can. You yes, can't you cut can. my salary after Absolutely you've employed me. Absolutely, they can. That's just ridiculous. If I went to, if if I went to you as an employee and said, "Look, I live in Silicon Valley, paying five six grand for rent, and um, you know it's really expensive to live around here, so I'm going to move to Wyoming, and." It's going to cost me like 150 bucks for a house, and you know I get a, a a horse and a dog sled, and everything is cool. Well, of course you're not going to pay me the same amount of money. Of course not. Once you've hired me at a salary, you can't. If I'm doing the exact same okay. work, you can't cut okay. my salary. Great. Then once I hired you with that salary, you are not allowed to move. You can't. You legally can't tell people that they. You can't tell a company that they have to pay you a salary that you uh, paid them to live in Silicon Valley in Wyoming. You can't. The cost of living is definitely lower in Wyoming, but if you've hired me at a hundred bucks, nope. you can't cut my salary back to eighty-five just I by can. virtue of where if, I live. If you if you move, I can. Yes, absolutely, Sean. See, You're is, wrong on this. This is why you suck as a boss. You you are so wrong on this. Yeah, and I I know this. I believe me. I know this one for a fact. This is like the Google thing. I know it. I know this one too. So you're <laughs> over <for> two. <laughs> if 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 you bring up one more thing that I know that you don't, then I'm hanging up. I guarantee this is not the case. There has been okay. um, significant. Uh, rumors, I won't say leaks, rumors about Apple Glass, mostly coming out in 2021. 
a, uh, a new leaker, relatively new leaker, a guy named John Proctor, who's been fairly accurate on, on several things, says that Apple will release this thing. It'll be $500, and it will come out in 2021. Now, another prolific rumor monger, um, I can never say his name, Quo, uh, Quo Ming Chao. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah, apologies yeah. for not being able to say his name properly. Yeah. I'm, I'm not making yeah. fun of his name. I just can't say it properly. He says, uh, yes, Apple glasses are coming, but not until 2022. Now, Prosser says Apple Glass is expected to retail for $4.99, but a prescription cost would increase the total to the user. Prosser claims he's actually seen working prototypes that have metal frames, but plastic, sorry, with plastic frames, but metal may be used later on. How much, how much stock do you put in the general rumor of Apple Glass and have the specific rumor of it coming out next year? All right, so first of all, um, Let's talk about these two guys. Okay. Uh, they have been incredibly accurate. No, I wouldn't say incredibly. They've been both accurate. Them. They've been accurate. Okay. They've been accurate. Both of them. Both of them have been accurate. So um, I have, I, I mean, I always have doubts about rumors because especially with the stuff like this, because they're, they're saying a year ahead of time that this is going to come. Okay. Well, you know. That's that's in the plus minus section of where Apple could just dump it or go forward, you know. So they're in the prototype stage. They're you know they're getting stuff ready. It could happen. It could not happen. So I'm always you know, eh, whatever. Yeah, it may 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 come, but you know, looking at the product, uh, is it? Is it something that can be better than what we've had before? Yeah. And and see, this is where once in a while, I, after I've been burned by saying, I don't see how Apple could do a trackpad and a keyboard better for the <laughs> iPad. Um, where, <laughs> and then they come out with what they did, and I haven't stopped using it since, where I say, okay, um, maybe, maybe they did come up with something yeah. new. And I'm not smart enough to realize what that something new is. Yep. So if they come up with something that is the same, then that I think that would be problematic. Yeah. Um, if they come up with something that's really fresh and new, but then the question always comes into my mind, if Apple was able to come up with something fresh and new on something that, and believe me, I go back and forth on that, something fresh and new in a product that Google had years ago, why didn't Google come up with this something fresh and new? But Google isn't as smart as yeah, Apple. Yeah. You know, so, and Apple has always come up with some speed on up. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, could it could it happen, and could it be that there's something incredible here? Um, am I sitting here waiting for it? No. I think these rumors. Hi, Birdie. <laughs> Hi, Birdie. I think these rumors are based on <laughs> prototypes that these guys may have seen, and. For those folks who may not realize, that Apple's working on prototypes of everything. Every, everything. Our, our, we were just talking about him, our, our friend Ron Klutz, who used to work at the model shop at Apple. <clears throat> the, he was working constantly on prototypes, on different things. Some have an idea, and Ron and his model makers would, would model it physically so you could see how it felt on your face or your hands or whatever it might be. That doesn't mean those prototypes are ever going to get made as something. So I think that's what might be happening here is that Ming Cho Kuo and Prosser have seen prototypes because right now, and again, this is us admitting that we're not as smart as Apple, but right now I don't see a reason for Apple glass. Just like I didn't see a reason for Google glass. The market doesn't, the market isn't crying out for some sort of iPhone on your face. You know what I mean? Well, think, think back, Sean. The only reason that the web, web was uh, the world was crying out for that is because there were rumors that Apple was doing something. Before that, there was no cry for uh, something new and uh, revolutionary until we found out that Apple was going to do it. And remember when we were so disappointed the first time because they introduced the rocker. 
That's <laughs> just a disaster. No, I, I, I disagree with you. There were people, no. myself included, when we had no. our Palm Pilots, we had our Blackberries, and we were able to access the internet. And you had to develop a whole different set of internet protocols. It was called WAP protocols. Um, that your internet, your, your website had to, be, had to be designed for the phone. And it was slow and painful. We wanted that to be better. We wanted those protocols to be well, better. So there's no doubt okay. that we wanted a better internet device. We had no idea what was in store. Oh, God. God, no. So, right. So, I, I mean, did any of these, uh, either of these guys say, and this is what it does? No. Yeah. So, you know, is what you said uh, accurate where they could have seen a prototype, a non-working prototype? Sure. Uh, and if they've seen it, why didn't they describe it? Or, you know, why didn't they say what it does and why didn't they, you know, there's, there's so many questions in these types of things yeah. that over the years, I mean, we, we've just come to look at that stuff. And unless a lot of those questions are answered, I look at that. Yeah. You know, yeah, it could. Yeah, Maybe not. It, it could. I just don't see a reason for it. And I, and then, then without seeing a reason for it, I see all the problems, prescriptions being one of the problems. Uh, the assumption is that these will have some sort of electronics embedded in the glass. Well, how am I going to get a prescription with that those electronics embedded in the and, glass? And, and, and how do you think? Apple just <clears throat> opened up a credit card company. You think they would open you up think, an optometrist? You think it would be hard for them to open an optometrist? An optometrist, if they wanted to, I absolutely do think it would be hard for them. Yes, I do. They, but I'm saying they could. The, the other, they could. Don't underestimate what they can do. The other thing, the other thing is, eyeglasses are not only functional, but they're also a fashion statement. Everyone mm -hmm. wants a different shape of glass, a different shape of frame. Not, That's what, not when it comes to Apple. You when think you're going to get Apple? one set of black frames with one shape? No, no, you won't get one. You'll get, but it'll be the same. And, and I mean, and that's where the problem comes in because we all know eyeglasses are supposed to fit the, the, the shape of your face. Oh, well, I, I mean, you know, nobody wants the same earphones as everybody else until they're white and you can walk around and show that you have <laughs> Apple earphones. I mean, you know, I, I, they can make this work. They really can. I, I doubt that. Other people could make it work, but no. they could make that work. Now, again, we're back to the very same first question. Is it going to happen? AR owl glasses. That is not happen. <laughs> no, way. no way Apple's going to do this. They do not celebrate their history in this way. They do not, I won't say care, but they certainly will ever portray something as some sort of Steve Jobs heritage edition or special edition or anything along those lines. That's not going to happen. I, I, yeah, I, I would have to agree with you there because that's the only one that would sell uh, because everybody would want those ones and they'd look <laughs> like dorks walking around. But yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah. Now the other rumor that uh, popped up that uh, got some traction was, uh, uh, Apple Insider and uh, Jean-Louis Gasset's Monday note about the Apple car speculation. That seems to be ramping up again. It seems to be tilting more towards Apple actually building a car. I've been saying for ye literally years, Apple's going to build the subsystems for inside of a car. But people are starting to believe that Apple's building its own actual physical car. Have you changed your mind one way or the other when it comes to the mythical <coughs> Apple car? Um. You know, I would think, and I'm going off of margins here, I would think that Apple would make more money off of the software than, than the, you know, a physical car. Yep. But it would be fun for Johnny to make a car. <laughs> but Johnny ain't there no more. But Johnny's still there. Come on. You think Apple would let John Johnny Ives develop or, or, or design their their new car. Well, uh, either that or it's going to look like a Taurus. <laughs> that's exactly. I think that's the big concern. It's going to look like a piece of crap. Well, I, I mean, I think that there, there's a lot. 
some of this may be coming from the fact that is Apple designing something for to test it out? I mean, yeah, that, that could very wants to get into the car business yeah. because, you know, technology wise and and efficiency wise, Tesla is probably one of the best. But I don't want a Tesla. I know a lot of people that do. I don't want one, but really? Um, no. Why wouldn't you want a Tesla? Because mm-hmm. I like the roar of an engine. Yeah. I I am, you know, maybe I'm too old for a Tesla or whatever. Although a lot of the people that I see driving Teslas are like blue hairs and stuff like that. But um, I I just I want to drive. Yeah. I I want to feel that power. I mean, I would get if I had that money, I would go buy a muscle car before I bought a Tesla. Yeah. You know, an old antique muscle car, like a, uh, a even the replica '65 Cobras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the Shelby's. I would definitely get one of those before I bought a Tesla, and I would, I would burn so much gas <laughs> in that thing, it would just be, you know, I I would I love those cars. I love oh. a lot of the tech in in, in a Tesla. I, uh, right. my, our, our friend V. Mori uh, has uh, has one, uh, the Series Three, and it's a really interesting technology oh, great in general car. about it. Great, I like. I kind of like the look for a fan sedan. It's it's, it's not a mm-hmm. bad look. Um, I hate that gigantic iPad they have for a dashboard, but otherwise, yeah, uh, the interior is nice. Uh, the X model is really really nice for a gigantic yep. SUV. I'm with you. I don't want. A Tesla from the point of view of I want a car. I can see the value statement of a Tesla, especially for uh, where we live. We don't drive that much anyways. I'm going to be our next buy anyway. It'll probably be a Leaf or something much, much smaller. Yeah. <clears throat> but I get the point of Tesla, and I don't I don't begrudge anybody who has a Tesla or wants one. I just personally don't uh, don't see one for myself. Well, I, and I don't either. And the, the bartender at my, my bar just bought one, and she absolutely loves yeah. this car. Yeah. Um, now, her husband just bought a Raptor, you know, one of the big Ford trucks. Um, Those but, massive, ugly, gigantic things. Yeah. So, and and he's like five foot five, you know, <laughs> like he's, he's, he's a, a short ladder to get into it. He, he, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So she bought this Tesla and she is so happy with it. Mm. I showed up, um, you know, like I normally do late in the day. It was about 11 a.m. And she said, do you want to go for a drive? And I said, sure. And it was very impressive. Yeah. All of the things in, in this car were very impressive from its automatic stop and you know knowing where traffic is and knowing where cars are knowing the stoplights and all of this stuff was very impressive but it was so damn quiet i mean if it had a roar in the engine i'd say oh yeah (laughs) yeah you know but yeah it was nice but nothing that i'm interested in Man, as Macken says, the acceleration is amazing. Yeah, it's, uh, their, oh yeah, their torque on those things is just absolutely incredible. <clears throat> but Fast, <clears throat> fastest car from zero to sixty there is. If you go with say an electric car, um, I don't see why they would. Same with the Apple glasses, I don't see why they would, because car margins are relatively small on right on uh, coupes are huge on trucks, but relatively small on family sedan type things. The turnover for AirPods, when you buy a new set every year, or an iPhone, you buy a new iPhone every three years, you're going to buy your car once every six to 10 years, depending on, on the quality of it. Yeah. yeah it just always going to make, it's always gonna make more sense to me that Apple will partner with somebody else, whether that be Tesla, which I, it's unlikely, but it might be. Or the I big, can see that. Tesla system is pretty advanced. Yeah. Yeah. True. I can't see Apple, but I can see, Ford or GM or BMW right. partnering up with Apple. I, I don't think that uh, Apple is going to be made. I still have yet to see any rumor that makes sense to me that tells me why Apple would build their own car soup to nuts. Well, and, and again, this goes back to um, the last uh, thing that we talked about. Could they do it? Yeah. 
Sure, they knew but they won. Yeah. There's so many questions yeah. that remain unanswered for me that, um, you know, I I think that's a, a fight that Apple could stay out of and be hugely successful. Now, interestingly enough, and this is, I love this discussion because these people always come out and it's not a, a knock on a Mo. Mo says, does it get you from one place to another in relative economy and comfort? Mo is not a cars and, and, and those kind of things. You don't care about getting from one The act of getting there, it's not the destination. It's the movement of your body and soul, as it is on my, on, on my motorcycle, that is the thing. It's not that right. I can get someplace in relative comfort that and relative economy. That's not, that's not it at all. Now, if, if all I had to worry about was getting from one place to another, especially in Silicon Valley, Mo is exactly correct. I would probably get a Tesla because who the hell cares? Yeah. It gets me from here to Safeway and back, you know? So that doesn't matter. But when, when Erica said, Erica wanted to buy a car that we could, uh, that's, uh, Shelby Cobra, that car yeah. when I pushed down on the pedal, but she wanted something that could, uh, we could travel in, you know, like drive three or four hours and she could be comfortable yeah. and we could go somewhere and stay for a couple of days and have that drive for me, but have the comfort for her. Sure. Well, there are only two and she wanted an SUV and I said well there are only two that I can think of that would be able to deliver exactly what you're looking for and that's a Cadillac or a Lincoln wait what yes. are you high I never thought that I would go for an American made car especially a but Cadillac or a Lincoln dude you're not an old black man <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling the cops on you. I'm calling them right now. What, so, so it came down to a caddy or, or Lincoln for you? That's yep. amazing. Yep, SUV. Um, and so we had an SUV Audi, you know, the Q5. Uh, uh, we had, uh, you know, several of these. I, I've had Lexuses. I've had all of this. The comfort just wasn't there. Yeah. You we went and sat in a, a, a brand new 2020 Cadillac SUV. Holy shit. I mean, it's like you're sitting in your, your uh, a captain's chair in your living room. I mean, that thing is comfortable. So that one is the one that we ended up getting. And when we decide to go for a drive, because, and keep in mind, she does not like to drive. She does not care about how much uh, G forces put on her when I step down a Porsche yeah. or anything. She does not care. She just wants to be comfortable. Well, that's a caddy. I'm looking at a picture. So, I'm looking at a picture of the 22 Cadillac SUV. That is one butt ugly vehicle. No, and the uh, it's an XT5 is the one that we got. So X, it's a smaller one. X X25, you said. XT5. XT5. All right. Let me look at the XT5. XT5 Cadillac. It's still, it's still going to be a Cadillac. It's still going to be butt ugly regardless. Oh, my. I, I don't care how butt ugly it is. That thing is like, it, it It does everything for you. When I sit in that seat, it massages me. It does everything. <laughs> it does everything. That looks like a massive, from the outside. I, the inside caddies always have. So, the reason, uh, because a friend of ours who's retiring, uh, he's a chiropractor. Retiring, he bought a place up in Oregon, okay. in Grants, pa Grants Pass, Oregon. And he invited us up for the weekend. So, the car that we have is um, a Mercedes, a convertible Mercedes. Yeah. So, great car. You know, love love the car. So, oh, the week that we were going and said, I'm going to rent an SUV. 
I said, why would you do that? We have a perfectly good car. Yeah. We're staying for the weekend. I mean, luggage isn't a big problem. We'll just, no, I want an SUV. I said, okay, well, that's what you want. Fine. We'll get an SUV. And then she said, <laughs> said wait, what? So I'm going to drive up to Oregon and you're going to sit in like the back seat. Yeah. She said, yeah, I'm going to sit back, <laughs> back there and I'm going to bring my iPad and watch TV yeah. shows. And while, while you drive, <laughs> well, you so for me. And I said, well, why, why are you going to do that? I don't get it. She said, well, I don't like to drive, which I knew. But she said, I also don't feel very comfortable out on the freeway for long periods of time. So I want you to drive. <laughs> and I want to sit in the back and watch TV. Because <laughs> I'm going to download all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. My iPad. And that's exactly what she did. <laughs> so I turned on podcasts. And I listened to like True, true Crime, yeah, In the yeah, Dark, yeah. Uh, a podcast. The entire way. Every once in a while, she would take off her headphones, say, everything okay? You need anything? (laughs) You know? What's up? Uh, Don't talk to me, chauffeur. You know? And and then that that was it. On the way up and the way back. It was like a (laughs) four-hour trip. So, when I got home, and and so, we ended up renting like a, a Chevy something And it was the most uncomfortable thing I have ever driven in my life. I was so sore. I won't tell you what I told um, my friends when I got there. But it was not nice because I don't want to freak out. (laughs) Um, It was awful. I was so sore when I got there and when I got home. So she said, okay, well, pick out a car that we can have for long trips like this that will be comfortable, okay? So you already had a Mercedes. Why wouldn't you go with one of the Mercedes SUVs? Because, well, those those aren't very comfortable either. They're like the Audi um, SUVs. They're not very comfortable. They're not. Uh, the Mercedes cars are comfortable. The, the, the SUVs are not. All right. I'll take your word on that. I never haven't been in any of them. So, <clears throat> wow. So just just go get a caddy because no. if you do, your lovely wife will be sitting in the back and giving you directions. No, actually, she won't. She's as bad with directions as I am. We we rely on our GPS, and even then we get lost. We're both yeah. a couple of thieves. There you go. Uh, you had a nice post up in the loop just uh, just for the show started and renewed love of print newspaper because of COVID nineteen. I thought you might like that. You said, Many of us can remember the days of picking up the newspaper and reading it front to back. I get Katie's need to get away from the screen for a little while. Newspaper is just the thing. That being said, when when's the last time you actually bought or read a newspaper, a physical well, you, paper newspaper? Okay, you don't want to go there because I'm there. it wasn't that it wasn't that long ago. How long ago was it? A uh, couple months. Couple months still. Why did you buy a newspaper? A couple months. So Erica's father, every time he comes, he reads the New York Times every day. Yep. And uh, we get the New York Times for him uh, when he comes. So yeah, it was a couple months ago. Yes, but you didn't uh, buy it for you. I'm saying, when's the last time you bought a paper for you? No, no, but I read it. No, you read it. But I, I'm saying, no, but you I bought it for somebody it. else. It's on, it's on my account. But you bought it for somebody else. When's the last time you bought one for you? Huh. Don't split hairs with me. No, I'm, you're splitting hairs because I bought the newspaper <laughs> and I read the newspaper. I knew I was going to ask this question. I was trying to remember myself. I cannot remember the last time I actually bought a newspaper. I think it might have been the last time I was quoted in the New York Times and I bought like 10 copies. Yeah, that was right. it. And, and it's, did, it's, you, did you get a chance to read that, yep. that story? Yep. Okay. So... Uh, for for those that um, that didn't read it, it was like this. She's a third generation journalist. Uh, her grandparents were in radio. Her father was a, 
um, was a, a print journalist yep. and she's a print journalist and she just, I'm, it, it was kind of a nostalgic read for me because you, you, you kind of get the feeling like be informed, you know, and it was wonderful. It was a wonderful read to me. And, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading her thing because I was connecting with it the entire time. Yeah. So, I think I think one of the problems that I have with newspapers was it started when I moved from Halifax to Vancouver. In Halifax, we had the Halifax Chronicle Herald. That was the paper we yep. got every morning. Everyone in Halifax got it. It was the morning paper. It was an afternoon I paper. There. there was an afternoon paper, wasn't there? At one point in Halifax, yeah, called the Mail Star. Mail Star, that's right? We got we got the, the morning one, and there were two distinctly different newspapers. When I was a kid. I loved just the article. I loved hearing the newspaper hit the floor. And before I went to school, I'm like nine, 10 years old. I sat at the kitchen table and I'd flip to the newspaper. And I loved doing this. I got older, I kept doing it. I get subscriptions to, to the Halifax Daily, Halifax Chronicle. And then when I had some money, I got a subscription to the New York Times. Ooh, that yes. to me is a big deal. Because to me, Americans may not realize this, but outside of America, the New York Times represents America, a certain segment yeah. of it. But you yep, think yep. whatever's in the New York Times is is America, good and bad. It's going to be reflected in the New York Times. So to me, that's how I learned about America was through, was through the Times. Then I moved to Vancouver in college, and we have two papers here, The Province and The Sun. And both of them are utter waste of trees. The province yeah. styled itself after a uh, British tabloid journalism type thing. Yeah. It was that kind of format, that magazine kind of format with big gaudy headlines and shitty stories. It was just awful. And the province was stuffy. It came in the afternoon, so the news was already late. It came in the afternoon, and it was uh, wrong quite often about things that I knew about. And that yeah. got me off daily newspapers. I would pick them up every now and then or read them at a friend's house or whatever. Then I moved to Nashville, and Nashville had a local paper that was also a complete waste of trees. And it got me completely out of the daily habit of reading a newspaper, especially as the news became more instant online. And then what I think killed it for me completely was reading the New York Times' descriptions of events that I was at or participated in, macro echoes yeah. and things like that, and seeing how often they were dead wrong about their news reporting. I'm not talking about their opinion pieces. Their news reporting. I remember one time at a Macro Expo, the, the uh, reporter uh, uh, said that we all rose up as one to give Steve Jobs a standing ovation. I was there. We did not do that. No, we did not. And I couldn't believe that a New York Times, this newspaper that I loved and adored, would literally lie about the news. Yep. And as I've gotten and older, I've seen them do it more and more and more. And that's why I lost my love of newspapers. Well, and I think a lot of that comes from the new type of journalist, yep. too. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. that uh, I, I think go in with um, a preconceived story and they want what whatever they report to uh, to match what they thought. Yep. Yep. And that's, I mean, that's just not the right way to do it at yep. all. It was crushing for me to, for no readily apparent reason, except to, at that point, that story, the whole point was these Mac Macs, these, these uh, fervent Apple fans. We were so caught up in the moment that we leapt to our feet and applauded Steve Jobs. Never happened. That yep. would never, ever happen. What happened um, was Jobs asked the Apple employees in the room to stand up and for us to give them applause. He did that fairly often at the end of a Mac World keynote. That's what the reporter was describing. But he said it was the audience, all of us on mass jumped up. And I wrote a letter to the New York Times. First of all, I've written a letter to a newspaper in my life saying this guy was dead wrong. I didn't get any response. But there were several instances in that one article where the guy could not have been at the event to describe it the way he did. And well, it, and remember, remember just last year at an event, the New York Times said that uh, uh, there were people crying at yeah. the Apple keynote. Yep. And it turned out to be a reporter for, what, the Atlantic or, yep. you know, something like that. I can't remember now. And she came out and said, yeah, I'm sorry, that was me. Yep. That wasn't, a, a, you know, um, a, 
a, a guest, that was me, and I was overwhelmed by, and, and it, it was an accessibility um, feature yep. that was on screen at the time. Very touching, I remember it. And it was very touching, and I remember taking the shit out of that guy yep. uh, for doing that because he was just so wrong with everything that he said. And because when he found out that she was from a big publication, he backed way up. Yeah, that's right. And that is just the ultimate of pussy moves right yeah. there. You know, you got something to say, say it. Don't stand, back, don't, stand behind don't, it. Don't back off now. Come on. Don't back off now. Yeah, but he did. And that just, it, it was awful. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree with you. But it certainly... I would love, I love the, the act of reading that newspaper. I loved uh, sitting in bed with a significant other and reading the New York times on Sunday, the gigantic Sunday edition of the New York times. Yeah. I'd love to get back to doing that. If I had a paper that I trusted enough, I right. wanted to give them the money to do that. I love that feel as she describes in her article, the feel of the newsprint and the folding of it just right. So you can read it on the subway and all that tactile cool. sensation that we no longer get. But is, is there a, a place that you actually trust enough these days? Now, I, I will be honest. I pay for the digital edition of Wall Street Journal yeah. and the New York Times, which I'm thinking of quitting yeah. both. Um, but I've had those for years. Yeah. And, and, you know, here I am taking the shit out of, you know, the New York Times guy for what he said. Uh, that was so wrong. And I'm thinking, and just recently, just this week, I thought, why am I doing this? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're like 30 bucks a month each. Why, why am I bothering yeah. with this? Why am I putting myself through this? Why am I wasting this money supporting yeah. these people when their journalism isn't very good anymore? It's not it's that high not quality stuff. Good. And maybe it wasn't good when I was 10 years old, but I just didn't know any better. Now I know better. I don't trust everything unquestionably I read in the New York Times anymore. And that's a sad thing yeah. for my 10-year-old self to hear because when I was 10, the New York Times was, the, it was it. It was it when it came to news, information, and trustworthiness, and good journalism. My love of journalism well, came from the New York Times. Let's, let's be honest. 10, where we grew up, is 20 anywhere else. <laughs> you had to grow up quick <laughs> in those parts. <laughs> <laughs> you got any questions for yeah. me tonight? I do. All right, fire away. Um, so this is not about graphics and photos. It doesn't have to be all the time. No, no, it has been, but it's not. So I would like to know where you get your music. My music? Mm. I am not. I mean, we, we know that you like disco. Oh, and that's shut great. up, man. I mean, shut up. That's great. That's great. You like all the froze and the disco and everything else. That's cool. I've um, seen your you know, playlist. You got Lawrence Welk on yours. So shut up. I, I, I dig it. I'm groovy, man. But <laughs> <laughs> you're a hip cat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hip to it. I'm hip to it, brother. <laughs> oh, no, we're, 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 we're <laughs> you asked. Yeah, yeah, where yeah. do you get, where, where do you get your music? I don't get new music at all anymore. I, 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 I I am the one I didn't of those. Say new music. No, I said where do you get your music? When I listen to music, it's music I've already listened to, I know and love. It's usually stuff from the seventies, sixties, seventies, and eighties, and mm. I get it off off Spotify for the most part. Spotify. Why? Yeah, Spotify. Because uh, we we are are let's say unwealthy in this household, and we can't afford two subscriptions. So uh, Melissa wanted to get a music subscription, and so we got the free trial of Apple Music. And she couldn't find any of her yoga music on Apple Music, but she could find it on mm. Spotify. And so we got a Spotify account for that, and we share the Spotify account. Isn't that interesting? That's, I wonder why that is. That's a good question. I have no idea, but she 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 knows the artist that she wants to listen to yoga music from. Of course. And she does yeah. searches in Apple Music. It doesn't show up. She just searches on Spotify. A bunch of it shows up, so that was a no-brainer yeah. for us. Because for me, the music I like is on both. You know, it just it's the old soul stuff, the old R I mean, Come on. Let's let's be honest. Sugar Hurl gang is everywhere. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm impressed you even. Hibbity, look at you. Hibbity, hibbity, hop, look at stop you. Talking to the bang bang boogie about the boogie. The boogie oh the my bang. god. Right. Okay, I'll give you props on that. I'll give you props on that. I know that, that song off by heart. I can sing every word of that. <laughs> I was surprised so, you even knew what the word Sugar Hill Gang was. Don't don't even don't even mess with me on Sugar Hill Gang. For me, it's Grandmaster Fl Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five and the Message. There, that song I can go. drop anytime you want. <laughs> there you go. Okay, that's All right. funny. You know, soon we're gonna we're gonna make it into Funky Cold Medina and. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Good old Tom Love, one hit wonder. Yeah. No, he had two wild things. Oh, that's right, that's right. But that, but that was a remix. So I, I, I don't count that. Hey, the original was uh, better. No, you, well, you got to count wild thing. You know, I can't count one wild thing. Um, so, so uh, what would make you? So, I, I had, uh, and I, I tried, I tried all of them. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I tried, you know, Spotify. I tried uh, that one with Jay Z. Um, title. I tried a title. I, I at Apple Music. I, you know, I tried everything that was out there, even Amazon Music, yep. uh, YouTube Music, or Google Music. I tried them all. Um, what would make you switch to Apple Music? Is it simply the the yoga music, yeah. or do you not like the interface, or? I didn't like the, I know I remember did not like the interface of Apple Music, but I would be okay with that because my musical taste music than I am. You listen to a lot more newer stuff than I do. I, don't, I haven't listened to anything in the past 20 years, anything new in the past 20 years. So for me, as long as whatever service we have plays those, has all that classical stuff, the classic rock and classic R&B and soul, and has the, the music my wife wants to listen to, which is the same taste as mine, plus her yoga, that's the service we're going to stick to at, at, at a decent price, at the $10 a month price. And Apple right. Music doesn't buy. Every now and then, Apple Music comes back with a with a with a, 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 an offer for a one-month free trial, whatever it is, and we'll search again, and her yoga music doesn't pop up, so it's a no-brainer to stick with Spotify. So it's, it's $14.99 for a family account, and that includes five or six – uh, what does the kid listen? Uh, he doesn't listen to music at all, which is very weird. Really? Yeah, he doesn't. He, he, neither of the boys do. They're they're not big does, music fans at all. It, does he know who the Sugar Hurl Gang no, is? No, God no. I don't. No, neither of them would. Neither one would have mm, a clue. Mm. Um, they they were that they right, were appalled. That right there is bad parenting. I agree. That and that's not that's not on me because I tried to play the clash for them. And they were just like, turn their nose up. And I wanted to have them both adopt a note. Because well, well, you, when you turn your nose up at the clash, you can't live in my house. No, they, they gotta go. I know. I, I know. mean, clearly that's, that's the next thing. They have to go. <laughs> they, gotta, they gotta go live somewhere else. I'm sorry. If you don't like the clash, your mom and I are dancing around the clash. And wow. You didn't like it. Yeah. That's now I know my, I know Damon is into a lot of newer music, but it's not something I want, want to listen to. It, it's just annoying. It's just, I find most, um, uh, not, not rock, but most pop music nowadays, whatever artist you want to name, I can't even name many of them anymore because I don't care. Their music, it's just annoying. He'll play oh, a song every now and then. And I'm like, oh, how can you listen to that crap? But I've gotten old and I've gotten solidified in my musical taste and I'm okay with that. Well, so. I, I remember going to an Apple event where they had uh, Kanye West. Yeah. And apparently he was on his second song and I still thought it was the first song <laughs> and because I said to the person next to me, and I can't remember who they were. This is a long song. And they said, no, this is the second song. One, uh, okay. <laughs> I love that. That is hilarious. Yeah, I, I thought <laughs> it was like no more than 10 seconds of Kanye West can I possibly so, stand. So I went to a, a Kanye West concert and um, uh, what's that um, festival called? Outside Lands. Okay. In um, San Francisco. Yeah. And they had, they had like one year they had the Who and Metallica yep. headlining, and I was all about that. Oh yeah, oh, and yeah. because because we knew the people, we were you know at the front of house, we were you know one of the concert. He just stood there, 
people. And I was like, what the hell is this? Why isn't he like, you know, singing the same song over and over? He talking to people, but that's what he did. Mm-hmm. So that annoyed me. The, the, the greatest con- concrete coffin of a building. Mm, yeah. And the first band was a reggae guy we'd never heard of called Bob Marley. Yeah. The second band was a Texas guitar player we'd never heard of named Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh my God. The third band was an alternative band we'd never heard of called Simple Mind. The fourth band was a band we vaguely knew a little bit about, but turned out to love them, the Talking Heads. And the fifth headlining band was the Police. Greatest wow. concert I've ever been to in my entire life. It wow. was amazing. We drove from Halifax to Montreal as 16 year old kids to go see this concert. And they gave us beer because it was Quebec well, and they didn't care. Well. <laughs> Let, let's let's be honest. Now, you did not drive up there for this concert. You drove up because you could get beat at a bar <laughs> illegally. Well, folks, you, you don't realize this, but in, in those days, I think still still now, uh, major acts didn't come to Halifax. You would never see the police no. in Halifax. I love the police. No, never. And never. you would never ever see the, the police in Halifax. So if you wanted to see the police, I was a huge fan. You had to go to the nearest big city, which was Montreal. Which was Montreal. A day and yeah. a half drive away. So and then got, and then you, you couldn't understand anybody. And, <laughs> you know. Oh, we can understand how to say beer. That, that was that was no problem. But yeah, yeah. that that was the greatest concert I've I'd ever been to, and I've been a huge Steve Ray Vaughan, Bob Marley, and and Simple Minds and Talking Heads fan ever since. So, well, I never got to see Marley. I never did. No, I I don't like reggae. I just I don't. Uh, but Marley, yeah, you know, that's some great stuff. I will still say I was completely blown away by Steve Ray Vaughan, just completely. Oh just mesmerized by you know reggae the bob marley stuff we were just kind of jamming to dancing to we really weren't paying attention simple minds we we, we knew about but stevie ray vaughn just jaw droppingly good we stood oh. there right in front of the stage just like oh my god this guy is doing stuff on a guitar we didn't know you could do on a guitar yeah. he was he was incredible so stevie ray vaughn played um, so most guitar strings come in, um, if you go to a store and buy a guitar, it will come with size nine guitar strings, okay. which are, are basically, uh, the size that won't cut your fingers to shreds. Okay. I didn't know this. Um, yes. So if you go and listen to like Zach Wild or some of this, the, the heavy metal, uh, that's really thumping. Or, or let's go. No, let's go to some of the metal, like Godsmack. Yeah. You know, and if you don't know what Godsmack is, go listen to it. It sounds really heavy. It's pretty cool. They they go to uh, tens, main uh, tens probably, and and they drop it down a little bit so that it sounds, and they drop it down a little bit more, and the strings are really thick. And I mean, it's just, it sounds. Um, Stevie Ray Vaughan used size 13. Jesus. <laughs> that's not a string. It's a cable. <laughs> right. So he was basically playing on, on like a bass guitar yeah, strings, yeah. you know, so size 13, he would, they would. Oh, so yeah. much. He would dip his fingers in crazy glue. Jesus. So that his finger and that man could play, yeah, and incredibly, like nobody else. I love the way that Stevie played. Yeah, and there, there is a, a video on YouTube, and I, I think you find it. You can find it by Stevie Ravon Broken String or something like that. He is in the middle of this massive solo during a concert, and it's like in a club, so they're up close. It's not like you know a stadium where they're way back. And he re, uh, looks over to his. You can see that he broke a string yeah. on his guitar while he's doing this massive solo. And he looks over at his guitar tech and nods. His tech runs out, 
Stevie takes the guitar off. They put the new guitar on, plug it in, and he keeps going on the solo and does not miss a beat. <laughs> that is yeah, talent. That is talent. Yeah, he's he's my second favorite guitarist after after Prince. I love Prince playing guitar, but mm-hmm. Stevie Ray was don't 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 even don't just don't. Oh my God! We're, we're ending the show really? right now. We're ending the show right now. Really? Good night. Really? That's where you're. I've been talking to wow. Jim Dalrymple of The Loop, his podcast, The Loop Report, mm. Dalrymple Report, mm. on iTunes. Just no, I'm not, I'm not letting you. I'm not giving you no, airtime. I, I, I no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to Prince on your podcast. You will not dis Prince on my podcast. I'm just I'm, saying. Okay. Well, so I, I said the third time you were wrong, I'm going to hang up. So All right. this is it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Jim. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Sean. Talk next week, buddy. See you. But <laughs> yes, I I will I will I will, I will, brook, oops, I will brook no argument when it comes to that. You can say I'm wrong, but not on my own podcast. No, 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 not letting you get away with that, folks. We're going to talk when we come back and talk about how to talk good. I'm going to give you some tips and tricks on how to uh, be a better speaker on your Zoom meetings and things like that. But first, here's a very important announcement from our good friend Vito More. It's Vito from Prince George, British Columbia. I listen to your Mac Life every week. I, I think I've been listening to your Mac Life for 20 years. We're talking about eight hours of entertainment a month on average. And the money every month. I want to keep the show going. I think you can to help them out. Help out Sean and Melissa. Send them some bucks every month. If you enjoy the show. Why not? Two. Four, five, ten, twelve, a hundred. See you there. folks thank you guys very much for joining me here on this wednesday evening on the show as always uh, we appreciate you guys being tuned in whether you're listening in live or whether you're listening to the archive we're back now with uh, my lovely wife melissa we are going to talk about now you have a lot of zoom meetings going on you know have you, have you gotten the, what we called zoom? usually because it's just it's a little bit easier to control a around the table face-to-face meeting is that because of Zoom or because your facilitators aren't doing their job? Both. Yeah. One of the things is we haven't been taught how to do Zoom meetings. This is not a natural not thing. Meeting. No, true, any meeting. Mm. This is not a natural thing for people to do, is how to manage a group of people around a desk or on a computer screen. One of the things I noticed listening today and what gave me the idea for this discussion was – one of the one of the things that you don't notice you do, I'm not saying you, I'm looking at you, I'm not mm-hmm. saying you, but people don't notice they do is, um, and whoever did your meeting today drove me nuts with I think every. You're talking about yesterday's no, it was meeting. this morning. Oh, because yesterday's was, was worse. Profoundly, yeah. I was just, I wanted, it was terrible. It was like, um, um, um. We do, um, you know why we do them? Because we want to fill a silent space. It's a placeholder. It's a, this is a scientific thing. It's a placeholder for what we're going to say next. And because our brains don't like that silence, we go, and tomorrow um, I'm going to go talk to um, 
Fred. Um, and then Fred and I are going, so just a break while you think about what to say next. And the easiest thing in the world to do, sorry, the easiest thing in the world to think about doing, but the hard thing to do is know what you're going to say before you say it. If you do, you won't say, um, because if um is a placeholder for your next thought, if you already got your next thought in your head, you don't need the placeholder. So what you do is before you speak, know what you're going to say next. As I'm talking to you right now, those pauses that you're hearing are me getting the next sentence in my head. So I don't have to say, um, I already know what the next sentence is going to be. I already know what I want to say. And one of the hard things for us to get used to is that break, that silence. Because in our heads, we think that went on for a minute. You think, oh shit, I haven't said anything in 30 seconds. When it's actually been half a second, a second, whatever it might be. And what you have to learn is your audience will keep listening. If you stop, they're not going to turn away after a second of silence. They're going to keep listening. And you can actually maintain their interest better by stopping. By just being patient, being clear in your head, and knowing what you're going to say next. And then you won't say, um. We talked about last week about uh, <clears throat> a wonderful man in my childhood named Bill Tyndall. And Mr. Tyndall, I've always called him, I think it's the first time I said Bill Tyndall in probably 30 years. Mr. Tyndall, I had a horrible, horrible stutter when I was a kid. It still comes out every now and then, but it was bad. It was, I was unable to communicate when I was seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. And Mr. Tyndall didn't make fun of me like the other kids did. Like kids are want to do. Mr. Tyndall took me aside and said, I know exactly why you stutter. Why, Mr. Tyndall? It's because you don't think about what you're going to say. What do you mean? He said, just think about what you're going to say. Pause, speak slowly, and think about what you're going to say before you say it. And as I practiced that, as a kid, I got better. I, got, I stuttered less. I notice I stutter now when I try to speak too quickly, which I do often, or I'm tired. I can really hear it when I'm tired or rushing for whatever reason to say something to get the words out very, very quickly. But if you just be calm, pause to think about what you want to say next, and then say that thing, you'll generally stop stuttering. Sorry, generally stop saying, um, except for the word like. Like's a little harder because like is, is not a, um, a pause mechanism. It's a connector to sentences. But still the same trick works. If you know what you're going to say next, you don't have to say like, although like can be a, more of a, I don't want to say dialect, but a, a verbal tick, much more so than um is. So think about that next time you have to speak in front of people or speak to anybody. Just stop talking. Think about what you're going to say next and then say it without making any noise whatsoever. And I know it's hard. I know it's very, very hard to do, but you've got to learn to do that because it's just it's grating. You don't realize it until you hear someone else do it. And then you don't realize that you're doing it unless you listen to yourself on a recording. But it's really, really annoying to people who have to listen to constant every now and then is okay but if every second phrase that comes out of your mouth is preceded by um 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 pretty soon it's all people hear they only hear the um and it will drive them nuts i guarantee it the other thing that i can teach you about public speaking in general but certainly zoom speaking specifically is don't look at yourself right now in the camera i'm looking at myself if you're, especially if you're using a, a Mac doctor, I think most cameras have got, sorry, most computers have got a camera up here and next to it is a light. Look at the light. Know that slightly to the left of that light, that's my camera. It's hard to get used to doing this. In some ways it's easy because I don't want to look at myself when I talk. I'd rather look at something else. When I first started doing a podcast and I got told this trick, 
they told me to just take a post-it note and write on the post-it note, look here with an arrow. And I put that post-it note right up next to my computer, right on my computer screen, little post-it note. So every time I looked up, I saw this arrow, look here. Okay, I'm looking there. And that's where I look. That's why I try to look whenever I'm talking to you guys on the show. I try to look directly into the camera. I don't look down at myself. I don't look over at Melissa. I'm trying to look directly at you guys. Obviously, when we're talking back and forth, when I come back, I always want to look directly into the camera. It makes it more natural for the person on the other end because they it makes it seem like they're looking, like you're looking directly at them. You don't notice because you can't see yourself doing it, but they do notice, I guarantee you, even if it's subconscious, they do notice that you're looking at them and not down at the screen. So try to practice that, that look here technique of put a little note there or a sticky note or whatever you need to do to remind yourself to always look up and see what you're going to and, and see what you're looking at. The other thing that I noticed, especially if you have to speak for a long period of time, Melissa, is doing, you're doing a presentation for, aren't you? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Never read your presentation. We've seen all kinds of people do do it. They just read the presentation. It's it's on, on notes in front of them, and they're just reading the presentation. Or it's on screen, and there's, you can just see their eyes going back and forth and reading the presentation. Don't do that. If you don't know your presentation well enough to do it off the top of your head without written out notes, you can have little reminder notes, little bullet point notes to remind you to say this, this, and this. But if it's written out, if you can't, do your entire presentation with, with it written out. Don't do the presentation, especially if it's an important one. So just make notes of it and know the notes ahead of time. You can refer to your notes. You can look at your notes and your note is one word or two words and come back to the screen and talk about it. But when you're talking for a long period of time, try to modulate your voice. A lot of people have a monotone when they're speaking publicly on a Zoom meeting. It's the exact same level. Raise your voice sometimes. Get excited about it. Lower your voice sometimes. Change your voice. Change emphasis on your voice. When you want to say something, this is important to me. This is important to us. I'd really like for you to learn this thing is very, that kind of stuff. Hit certain words and sentences and practice doing that. Know your presentation off by heart. That You could do it. My presentation that I do for my starting point photography classes is almost all images. And I know my presentation so well, I can see the image and I know exactly what I need to say. I know exactly what points I want to say. Now, granted, that's because I've been doing the presentation for 10 years now, but I know the points of my presentation. Melissa, you've been practicing yours for a week, a week and a half, every now and then you go back and forth. Mm -hmm. How much of your presentation do you think is you reading off the screen? And how much of it is, is in your head of things that you know you want to say? Well, I have things in, I have both because it's sort of a new, it's a new frame of reference. And I, and I just want everybody right now just to understand this is, this is what we could do. Um, so, but I am going to be talking a lot just about the philosophy of it yep. and everything. So I'm not going to be reading everything. Good. I will be reading some things. Because mm -hmm. it's not your presentation. You didn't put this it's first not, I, I, not this one, no. Yeah. no. That, makes, that certainly makes it harder. If, if you're not the one who has created the presentation, mm -hmm. you may not know what's when coming next. you get next. headings and kind of like, what, what yep. did they mean just there? So, yeah. Monty makes a good point. He says, uh, this is, I believe, why Steve Jobs practiced his keynote speech so much ahead of time. Jobs was an insane practicer of keynotes. He would practice every day <clears throat> for 30 days before the practice, he would do a full run through every single day mm -hmm. for the 30 days ahead. Only the people involved in their segment were in the room. He would clear them out. So he would stop on a regular basis as people moved out and moved back in. But he would, he knew his presentation inside and out. Some people may not realize this keynote, the Apple um, competitor to PowerPoint was developed for Steve Jobs. They actually built a presentation software for Jobs, and it was so good that we, we can sell this thing. We can give this out to the world. I like Keynote much more than, than PowerPoint. Um, I did it on. So Jobs, yeah. would, <laughs> Jobs would practice obsessively. I knew a couple of the tech guys who did the behind the scenes stuff of um, the uh, uh, putting together the equipment 
for a Steve Jobs keynote. And they were like, yeah, he's doing this for three hours every single mm. day. But see, a lot of people, I mean, I, I, I put together a PowerPoint, but I don't have that kind of time That's right. to That's the thing. do, you know. <laughs> and so you can see that in keynotes nowadays. You can see all of them, Eddie Q, um, Tim Cook, all of them looking down. There's uh, at a, a keynote for Apple execs, there are two screens um, below the stage where you see them looking down. There's a, uh, a slide that is the present slide that's behind them. Then there's the next slide is coming up. And so they're looking down and doing that. Jobs really did that. But when he did do it, he did it so elegantly. Mm. He did it so naturally. Unless you knew what he was doing, you didn't know that's what he was doing was looking down at the slide. He'll, he would do it just in a very natural kind of way. His head would keep moving. And he would just look at the slide and kind of come back to you. But you see Tim Cook quite often. This is not a knock on Cook. Not everyone's a great public speaker. Cook would look down, read the slide, and then we'd come back to the audience mm. and, and talk. Eddie Q's done it. I've seen Phil Schiller do it. Phil Schiller is better, better than most. But um, Craig Federighi, another good, really good present, presenter at Apple. So, I love listening to Barack Obama. I could listen to him for well, hours. Well, they're cheap because they've got, they've got teleprompters. It's still and amazing. Obama was so good at his, at just his teleprompter. Just beautiful yeah. and just, oh, and just everything. He's funny. Very brilliant. natural. He's everything. Yeah, he's a very, the, Obama had the, the advantage of being a natural speaker. And to he begin connects. With, and he connects. And, yeah. <clears throat> and that's, in theory, um, the way I am too. I'm a, hopefully I'm a natural public speaker public speaking i love talking to an audience and that goes that's probably 85 percent of the battle right there mm -hmm. is getting over that fear that rightful fear that so many people have of public speaking but those are a couple little tips that you can use don't say um know what you're going to say ahead of time that'll avoid the um take that pause there's no harm in just stopping while you think of the next thing that you want to say when it comes to doing Zoom meetings or any kind of video meeting, look into the camera. Don't look at the screen. Don't look at yourself. Look into the camera. That would be a whole lot less distracting than staring at yourself. It looks better from the other side. And then make sure you know your presentation inside and out. You could do it blindfolded, that you would be able to say everything that you need to say in your presentation, even if you didn't have it all written out. Those would be three or four things that will really help your presentations. Do you have any tips? Oh, well, I think, especially on Zoom, it's very difficult to questions. It's it, because it's not an organic thing because someone will go, oh, someone will talk. Yep. Like the, it's, it's, um, it's just kind of tricky. So, so what I think is a great idea is just to say, you know, I'm going to get to a certain point in this presentation and then I'm going to, Stop yep. and get some questions. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Corey's going to met women in the chat room for me, and <laughs> you just got to be. Uh, Zoom is, and then often people will suddenly talk over each other, or, um, or the oh, you're on mute, or it's just it's very strange. No. I would for you. I would, and there's a feature we'll do this in Zoom. Mute everybody. Oh, I'm going to. So that way they can't, even if they oh, start no, no, talking, no. You, you. I know. I'm going to say, I'm, I'm muting everybody. I just want to do this piece. No. Put your questions down. Corey's going to monitor them. And then we'll answer no. questions. And during that question period, I can give them an opportunity to ask more via no. the chat room. Because on Zoom, it's really tricky. Dave D says, one more thing, Sean. I, he says, be passionate about your subject. That's, yeah, unfortunately for me, that's just natural. I wouldn't talk about something I wasn't passionate about. Um, other people are forced forced uh, by work to talk about things that maybe they're not as passionate about. But yeah, that helps a lot to have a, a great deal of passion for whatever it is that you're talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. AV says, your audience can tell immediately that you're just phoning it in. That's so true. We know that automatically. Don't forget, send in your entry forms for the Nomad Contest. The nice folks at nomadgoods.com are giving us a $100 gift certificate to give away to someone on the show after Father's Day. It's not a Father's Day contest. Anybody can win. You've got to be a father. You when is Father's a, Day? Uh, June 21st. Oh. So June 24th show, we'll do a drawing for the $100, $100 gift certificate from the nice folks at Nomad. Go to the website. It's a great website. They've got a lot of great products. 
take advantage of their free cable for the planet offer. You, know, you give them five bucks, they give you a free cable. They take that five bucks and they give it to organizations that are planting trees. You can't go wrong. It's a great deal. You get a great cable. They get five bucks to give to a charity and all that money goes to the charity to plant trees for our planet. So check it out. Cable for the planet deal. Um, all you have to do is uh, go to the website, yourmaclifeshow.com, right there at the top of the page. You'll see Friends of YML contest entry form. Fill that form out. It sends me an email. I drop your name into a virtual hat, and we'll choose out of that on January 24th. But if you're a subscriber to Your Mac Life, like Vito wants you to be, if you're a subscriber at 2 5 10 15 bucks a month, whatever it might be, you're automatically entered into the contest. And for any amount over the $2, you get an extra entry form. So if you're a $10 Donator, you get four entry forms, two, four, or five. I'm not quite sure how you get extra entry forms. <laughs> so please uh, do that. Subscribe to Your Mac Life. Go to the website, yourmaclifeshow.com. On the left hand side, there you'll see the subscription it comes out of your PayPal account or to your major credit card. Each month it comes to us and, and we use it to buy stuff. Uh, anything else? I think we're done. Folks, that's it for tonight's show. I want to say thanks, as always, to our good friend Jim Jarrett of The Loop at loopinsight.com for being here each and every week, even though it is a condition of his parole. I want to say mm -hmm. thanks to you guys being tuned in with you, tuned in live or listening into the archive. We appreciate you guys listening to the show. As always, I've been Sean King. I'm Melissa King. And you're listening to your Mac Life. See ya! Bye.